Okay, it is now live and I just want to welcome our attendees joining us today. Uh, my name is Rick Hansen, everybody. I'm your local history librarian at the Greenwich Library. We do plan to get started in just about a minute. So thank you to our attendees joining us. And I see uh, Zoom is allowing a fair amount of our attendees to come on in. I thank you for your patience and thanks for joining us tonight on this nice Tuesday warm evening in Greenwich. Now Zoom may be new to some of you. We're connecting from a lot of different locations. I hope you can explore some of the features on your screen. And as attendees, you'll notice there's a Q&A section. And we're going to use that section to uh, read questions at the end of the program if time allows it. And we do plan to get started in just a minute as uh, more attendees come in. So thank you, everybody. And I do see we're just about to hit the one minute mark past uh, seven o'clock. So I do think we have a fair amount of attendees here and it's a good time to start. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Rick Hansen. I'm your local history librarian at the Greenwich Library. And we are connecting, as I mentioned just a moment ago, from many different locations with Zoom. Uh, now, Zoom may be new to some of you, and we're using the Zoom webinar format this evening. Now, this will better help us accommodate our great audience size. So that means with the webinar format, we cannot see or hear you as attendees, and you cannot see or hear each other as attendees. But take a moment, explore some of the features of Zoom on your screen, and you will be able to locate a Q&A section. Uh, and we'll use that today so you can submit any questions you have during the presentation. Our moderator and our panelists are happy to answer questions after di the discussion, so please send them in. This evening's presentation is expected to run about 45 to 60 minutes. And again, please send in those questions or comments through the Q&A section. We have reserved time at the end to review, so we hope to be able to get to some of them. We are recording uh, so that we can use this video later, but remember with the webinar format of Zoom, we cannot see or hear you as attendees and you cannot see or hear each other. So without any further delay, I'm excited to welcome our moderator and panelists. Sunny Unger is our moderator. Sunny is the CEO and founder of Serendipity Magazine. Chuck Hilton is our first panelist and author of the new book, Classic Greenwich Houses which is available at the library and Diane's books. Chuck leads Charles Hilton Architects. Amy Hirsch is our second panelist. Amy leads Amy Adenis Hirsch Interior Design. And Bill Andrus is our third panelist. Bill is a realtor with Sotheby's International Realty with listings that previously placed him as Sotheby's number one agent in Greenwich. Here is Sunny with our program titled Exploring Greenwich Homes, Industry Experts Project Greenwich Area Trends in Architecture, Design and Real Estate. Sunny, I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Rick. Um, I am thrilled to be here um, and to be a part of tonight's conversation with some of the area's key experts in their respective fields. A quick hello to all our serendipity readers tonight. And for anyone who's not familiar, we hope you'll check us out at serendipitysocial.com. And we hope to be able to actually to keep this video on there as well. So um, as I mentioned, it's exciting to be here tonight with this panel, all of whom we've worked with in the past and known to have their fingers on the pulse of everything home. Home has always played an incredibly important role in our daily lives, but I think we can say, and we can all agree, this year saw us looking at our homes through a very different lens. The key words we've used to describe our dream home, spacious, sanctuary, remote, accessible, were amplified and likely re-examined as we faced the COVID-19 pandemic. Some trends have shifted tremendously, while others have further rooted into the daily conversation. Tonight, our panel will explore the latest trends and patterns they are seeing in our area and where they see them heading in the year ahead. As Rick already mentioned, Chuck is the principal at Charles Hilton Architects, an award-winning Greenwich-based design firm specializing in quality custom residential architecture 
sustainable design, and waterfront projects. Since founding her firm in 2006 in Connecticut, Nate, or Connecticut native Amy has been creating one of a kind homes with expert skills in all, in all aspects of interior design. Her unique proven process and her thoughtful design solutions have landed her projects across the country, spanning from Montana to Wyoming to Colorado, Bahamas, Martha's Vineyard, Manhattan, and of course, Connecticut. Bill is one of the top residential real estate brokers with Sotheby's International Real Estate. Bill has represented his clients in transaction total over 700 million over the past 30 years. The personal integrity that he brings to the business, as well as his professional approach, has earned him a stellar reputation and unique perspective about the landscape of real estate in this past year. With that, I'm going to start with some questions for our panelists about how to create perfect home and some key next steps before Rick turns it over to the virtual audience for additional questions. Bill, let's start with the real estate trends and potential shifts you've seen in the last year in the Greenwich area. What are the key things you find homeowners are asking for now and how has it changed? Sonny, I think that people today are taking into consideration how their lives may play out in the coming months and the year ahead, given the situation that we've all faced in 2020. And I think they're looking carefully at indoor and outdoor spaces. And specifically, I think they're looking for a place to work at home and also for a place to work out at home. So I think those are the two things that we as realtors have seen in this last 10 months or so. Uh, with COVID-19 in our lives. I think we're still seeing traditional homes. Chuck is a perfect example with his sensitivity towards the traditional vocabularies. But I think we're seeing a little bit of a twist, a fusion of traditional and modern. And by that, I mean, we're seeing more open spaces. We're seeing homes with more modern design elements and larger windows and spaces that flow one into the next more so. And I think these are some of the elements that the core of our buyers today have been demanding, especially within the last few years. Yes, absolutely. All right, with that, so Amy, when do you, knowing that, when do you think a homeowner uh, should get a designer or architect involved in uh, the buying process? I think it's always great to be a part of it from the beginning. We just actually went with a client most recently that wanted to downsize and you know they want our opinion they want our guidance so i think it's always a detriment when a homeowner asks a designer to come in you know four or five months after a process so it's really beneficial to them to have the whole team early on and and to integrate us you know in the beginning and we're happy to do it and chuck do you feel the same absolutely i mean i think the, you know the earlier we're in the more help we can be you know, I, I frequently look at homes for prospective buyers and, and realtors and kind of, you know, I mean, there's there's you know, some evaluation of the general condition, although they have a home inspection for that. The most important valuable thing is, you know, if they're planning on making changes to the home, you know, knowing whether it's feasible to do. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's both practical uh, construction tasks and sometimes it's codes, regulations, those kind of things. So, you know, we have some of that in the back of our mind and then you know, the, there's often questions about budgets and, and you know, while it's hard when it's so uh, conceptual to put firm budgets, you know, you can give them some guidance on per square foot cost or work with a contractor to, to assist with, with some kind of budget so that they know uh, if they buy it and what they want to put into it. So we, we, we can be helpful in a number of different ways um, early on. So, so Bill, with that, are homeowners looking more for an existing home to, to make it their own? Or do they want, are you seeing more people want a new build? Sonny, I think over the last 15 years, there's been a real premium on new construction. And I think we as realtors have seen that with the advent of so many teardowns, I think 15 to 20 years ago, we saw teardowns and rebuilds because essentially there's no more raw land to build in Greenwich. The majority of new homes that are being built are being built on existing sites. But I think the reason new is so appealing is my expression is new is nice. 
new is nice. There isn't a person out there that I think, given the choice, would choose a used home over a new home. And it's probably for several reasons. Uh, I think, number one, you have virtually no or very certainly low maintenance in the first few years. And things like a roof or mechanicals can be big capital expenditures. So I think when people can sidestep that and walk into a new home and for virtually 15 to 20 years not have to deal with that, I think there's something very appealing about that. As well, I think a kitchen that's never had a meal cooked in it or a master bath that's never had a shower taken in, there's just something warm and fuzzy that feels good to the buyers today that are looking for new. I think there's one other thing too, that the new construction as Amy and Chuck know, the new construction offers a whole different element that older homes don't have. And we saw this beginning about 15 years ago with the advent of the lower level. It used to be called basement when we were growing up, but in the last 15 or 20 years, we've seen these finished lower levels that have 10 foot ceilings and a gym or a nanny bedroom and bath and a playroom or a wine cellar. It's a whole new world. And I think when buyers are exposed to that, as opposed to a more traditional older home that lacks that, it's very easy to find that extremely appealing. Uh, that, no, that makes sense. So Amy, what are, then what are some of the common requests that you're seeing? Like, um, has there been a shift in which rooms of the house are getting the most attention right now? I think people are looking for separate spaces. You know, they, they, they need a quiet space. They need spaces for their children, spaces for husbands and wives to work within. So, you know, the dining room has now become a space that is a library or it's their office or it's a place to play games for the kids. So I think we're looking, we're looking at a lot of different spaces. I mean, the bar has been, I think, the top one for everyone. So and we love to design bars, but it's how do you incorporate these things? And I think with the summer, it was how do you incorporate the outside with the inside? You know, pool houses became ever more evident because people weren't going anywhere. So, you know, that was really important. And just, I think, having the key pieces within their house, it's, or, or editing out, that's what we saw. We saw just how do we make our home more comfortable within this environment? Uh, Chuck, are you seeing the same kind of thing or what are the most common requests that, you, that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think recently it's been maybe uh, an amplification of things, of trends that were kind of already started. Um, certainly, you know, as Bill mentioned, the home office and, you know, we need not, not one, but at least two, if not more, you know, for children doing homework, the ability to kind of close those spaces off and have quiet spaces. So some, sometimes it's a flex space as Amy's uh, suggesting or, or some, you know, we're actually, you know, the, the, the his and her offices um, are, are kind of almost mandatory. The indoor outdoor living was always, you know, it's been a big theme in recent years, but of course now, you know, every, everybody needs to be outside and um, people are feeling really comfortable about, you know, investing in, in those spaces even more than before. The, um, you know, as Bill said, that the kitchen family room area, I mean, the cooking, uh, a lot of people are cooking at home and, and that, you know, that's been a, a kind of an ongoing uh, trend. Um, just as, as uh, people entertain more and more and more and more casually, as Bill said, but, um, you know, certainly with COVID, um, people are doing a lot more in, gar you know, gardens and chicken coops and, you know, everything related to that. Um, you know, there's, a, there's another kind of broad trend that, that touches on a lot of things, which is, is healthier homes. And, you know, as the population ages and, you know, in, in, in light of a pandemic, people are looking at everything about their house. Uh, they're spending a lot more time there. Um, they're looking at the lighting, the HVAC systems, um, and, you know, the, the finishes and, and things that they don't off gas, um, quiet spaces, yoga, meditation rooms, all kinds of things for, you know, healthy body and healthy mind are, are coming to the forefront. and and becoming you know, not a big request. Now with, with all of that, Bill, it, with, with knowing all the way that homeowners are, are pivoting and, and making it towards you know, their needs right now, is, is that something, or, you know, is the market okay with something like that? Or do they need to also stay focused 
on if they put their house on the market eventually. Is this okay that, you know, are you seeing that it's okay for us to be, you know, taking care of ourselves, our health, our offices, the needs of right now? Sunny, I think very much the answer to that is yes, because we're all in the same boat. We're all going through this together. We're all experiencing it together for the first time. In fact, Chuck reminded me of something. I sold two homes this year that both had first floor ensuite bedrooms. Huh. And the reason that was appealing to my buyers in both cases was because they planned to have either a mother or a father or a family member living with them. And I think we hear this term all throughout the news, sheltering in space, sheltering in place. And I think these extra spaces, when a home offers that, can be a real perk for somebody who plans to have extended family or guests on a more than part-time basis with them. Uh, that, no, that, that makes sense, absolutely. Um, I feel, Sunny, that most people, yeah. most clients are saying that they, you know, they, they want to stay home, that they intend to stay home, yeah. right? They don't really look to go back to New York to go to work. So they really are making the investment in, within their house. And how do you do that? And how can we work better within these spaces? So that's been a really big um, you know, it's sometimes it's a challenge because in some of these homes, you know, they don't have these spaces. So you have to, you have to create them within, within their format and within their foundation of that. Yeah. I mean, we see a lot of, you know, you're seeing parents with college students, you know, all the way down at home. That's, that's a lot of home offices. That's a lot. Um, so Bill, what improvements are in high demand and likely to add value short time and long term, like long term? Sunny, I think probably this has been in place for a while, but I would say the three big elements that most homeowners, most home buyers are looking for is a dynamic kitchen family room. As I said earlier, that's the number one space. When all of us are awake, wherever we live, we're spending the majority of our time in those spaces and a nice large kitchen that's eat in and segues into the family room is number one, I think, on most people's lists. I think number two is a dynamic master suite, something that has wonderful space for a nice, large, commodious bathroom and walk-in closets. And I think the third element that's important is that extra space, whether it be the lower level that I mentioned earlier, which is a whole world unto itself, or a third floor space where people can have a playroom for kids or a theater or a whatever it is, a gym. I think those are the three big items that I think have been for some time and will continue to be long-term in demand. Chuck, how, I mean, what, what, are, what kind of demands are you getting on improvements that you, that you feel like are gonna make a big impact, whether it's short or long-term? Well, I think, I think Bill hit on, on a lot of the major ones. I, you know, the, the indoor, outdoor, Entertaining spaces are, are very popular. I mean, any place, you know, Greenwich homes are family homes and people want to spend time with their immediate family and they also want to entertain their friends and go on vacation in their backyard and, you know, and have a sanctuary to escape, you know, the day-to-day -day stress and pressures. And, and, and so I think, I think any of those things. And so, you know, I mean, I know the pool contractors are, are going crazy building outdoor pools and, and even though it's seasonal, um, but the, the grilling, the outdoor kitchens, um, those kind of spaces, the porches, uh, I think I'm going to add to what Bill said, but, um, you know, he's right on in kitchen family rooms, certainly a, a nice master suite, um, or, or top of the list. Amy, what about you just design wise? Well, I think designers, I think it's also been consistent, right? I think that within our environment, people are always striving for this and wanting this. So it's not like it's been, it's been a change, but it's not anything different than that's been entered into our world. You know, everybody wants the fire pit, everybody, the outdoor has become much more of a, a domain that people want to be in as opposed to inside. But I think that we're finding that people also want their own spaces, right? They really, you know, all of a sudden husbands have come home and they're in everyone's space and everybody can't get away from one another, right? So I think we're finding that people just want little sanctuaries to be able to go off to in their master or their dressing closets and what's within there so that they can spend that extra time for themselves there. And then, you know, whatever that quiet time is. But you know, again, it's the same thing. It's that open living. And, and I think that's also been helpful because as a family, you can all be together 
as well. So that's that's been huge and it's just a constant. Oh, that makes sense. And and Bill, or I guess all, but- um, Hey, you know, Sonny, I, mean, I, would, I would just jump in and say another interesting trend the last couple of years is uh, golf simulator rooms. And we're, we're on our third one in, in two years and, you know, maybe a fourth one almost. And, you know, I think uh, in addition to uh, keeping, uh, keeping the game in good shape, it's become a, another home entertainment space where you can hang out with friends and, uh, entertain, you know, off season when you can't be in the, the outside. So. Yes. I've lost my garage. Um, <laughs> beautiful, large garage. It is yeah. now a golf simulator room with a bar. Yes. Like I, yes, I've seen, bar, that, yeah. seen that one before though. When, they, when I know we've had a big influx of, of people from New York city as well, obviously coming out here during this time, are, are you seeing anything different out of what they what they're looking for in comparison to, you know, the typical family from Fairfield or Westchester, you know, looking for a house in Greenwich. Sunny, I think they're all pretty consistent. Uh, before the show, Amy and I were talking and she asked, where are the majority of our buyers coming from? For many years, the answer has been a combination of New York City, Westchesterites escaping the taxes in Westchester, and people moving within Greenwich. I call musical houses. They're moving from one location to another within Greenwich. So I think that's pretty consistent that we're seeing all of those three groups looking for the same things that we had mentioned earlier. That makes sense. No, absolutely. Um, the things that I might just throw in here as a, maybe our audience might be interested to hear is probably anecdotally people have heard that the year has been a very good year. That would be an understatement. The real estate market has enjoyed a banner year. It's been fantastic. And none of us, I think, either in the design field like Amy is or in the architecture field like Chuck is, none of us could have anticipated this back in January or February. But I think March 16th seemed to be the day that turned the corner for me and for most realtors. And we have remarkably sold 709 homes so far this year, which is just incredible. It's 182 more than sold in all of last year. So it has really been a bonanza and to see a 35% increase in units and we still have eight weeks to go is quite remarkable. Now, I know Chuck mentioned earlier uh, the pool. Have you, is that, is that, you know, all of us here, you know, the, the pools of great investment, are, are you selling a lot of, I mean, has that been a hot commodity for selling homes? I think that's an answer that varies from buyer to buyer, Sonny. I think some people are afraid of pools and they're afraid their small children will drop in and drown. I think other families have a feeling completely opposite and welcome it as an addition if it comes with a home. But I think as Chuck mentioned earlier, we're all in one place, which is our homes. And I think we want to get the most out of it. If we're not able to go to the beach or we're not able to go to Bruce Park or some of the municipal facilities, I think a pool is very welcome on the part of a lot of buyers, and especially if they don't intend to join a club. Absolutely. Amy, uh, how about, I mean, have you seen anything different in the sense of everyone coming from New York City or, you know, versus the typical client you have coming from Westchester or the local area? I think it's just a flurry of people. I yeah. think that people are just coming and it's like a stampede. And I think that it's a lot of educating on our part of just the process and how long it takes. And you know, everybody wants it so immediate. And I think that they, you know, just for their sense of being and, and, and getting out of the chaos. But, you know, this process is a very long process and it's a very well curated one. And I think that that's, that's part of this, right? You can't just snap your fingers and your home is completely decorated. And if there has to be renovations or adjustments and, or even if people are downsizing, it's a lot of editing that has to happen. So, you know, it's a, it, it definitely, is, is this is what we're seeing that it, everybody's just in such a hurry to get into a home. But then there are the people who do realize that, you know, this is a process and that does take the time and they are willing to do it. So most of the current clients that have come in from New York, you know, they want to renovate the kitchen. They want to update it. And again, they're coming from smaller spaces into larger spaces. So how do they live within this, right? I mean, these are almost, you know, 5,000 square feet larger than that they're accustomed to. So. It's a, it's definitely an adjustment for them. 
So Amy, then that leads me to the question, how long does it typically take um, to, you know, to design a home, you know, from start to finish? I think there's a lot of engagement that happens in the beginning. You know, we, we go through a really fun process and it's a very um, organized process, but it's one where clients will answer our questionnaire and they answer it separately. And on top of it, they, you know, they are a collaborative component to what we do. So we, we really need their undivided attention. That first beginning part can take anywhere between three to four months of curating it, getting into proposal forms, them approving things, and then procuring it. And now with the way that COVID is, I mean, it's been difficult to get product and it's not as easy to get it. So what used to be, let's say, you know, a, a four month deal can be now six months. And I think it depends on the scale of the home and what the client wants to do. But, you know, on larger homes that can be, you know, you're ranging from a year to 18 months and some projects we've done take a year, three years. It just depends upon how much architecture is involved and, and then how much decorating is required. So Chuck, I'll, the same question to you, you know, more on the build obviously side of the house, what, you know, what do you typically, you know, what does it typically take to build um, a home from start to finish? Um, well, again, it, a lot depends on the size of the project and, you know, whether how, if it's a new home, how big it is, but, you know, it, it's about a three month process for the initial design. I mean, we spend the first month getting to know our clients, talking through wish lists, uh, reviewing sizes of rooms and, and what's important to them, doing design research and comparing our photos and clippings with theirs and really kind of getting on the same page uh, along with doing maybe some, some regulatory research. Then it's three to four weeks in a design process. You know, first week we're brainstorming every great idea we can think of, second week kind of wrestling with it, and third, third fourth week doing presentations. Then, you know, the client needs to review it and, and think through. And then there's a, you know, usually a couple rounds of, of some revisions. So you're, you know, no matter what the project is, it's often maybe for a new house, maybe three months or, or a little more. Then, you know, we do budgeting, which takes a few weeks into a month. And once that's done, construction drawings, and that could be, you know, a few months to a year or more, depending on the size of the house. And also depending on how you're going to contract for it, whether you're going to fast track it or, or try to do everything up front. And then, of course, you have the, you know, the, uh, the construction time. So, you know, I think a ballpark, you know, would be 18 months to 30 months, depending on the project, uh, you know. And, and do you think, you know, knowing where everything, where the market's going and trends and so on, is it worth adding square footage to your house if there is opportunity? Um, and what improvements make sense um, if you're not, you know, if you can't expand or you don't want to expand? Yeah, well, the, I mean, first of all, I mean, you, you kind of either need the space or you don't. I mean, first of all, you know, do you need the space? Or do you have enough space that just isn't working well? That's one thing. Um, uh, things like ceiling heights are really difficult to change and and not very cost effective. You know, if you have an eight foot ceiling on the first floor and you're dreaming of a house with a ten foot ceiling, it, it doesn't renovate well. Um, and you know, so ceiling heights can be challenging. You know, do you have enough good light? And and how is the basic circulation? And can that be fixed? Um, and, and then, you know, just the amount of physical space. So, you know, so, sometimes it makes sense to add on or rebuild. Um, and sometimes the space is great and it just needs to be reconfigured or refinished and updated. And um, it's kind of all over the map. So it's, it's a bit tough to generalize, but um, comes down to there's a few fundamental things like that that impact that answer. Okay. Bill, are it, it's it, to you with the same type of question. I mean, are you seeing it in the in the market? Is it you know is it worth to is it worth to add on to add more space, or is it you know more about improving what you have? Sunny, I think it really depends upon that specific buyer. I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. I think you get to know your client in all our respective businesses. Chuck and Amy and I, I think, are doing two things consistently. We're educating people and we're also helping them to align their expectations. I think it's the double E. 
And I think when we're educating them, we're showing them, in my case, the market and what they can get for the budget they have. In Chuck's case, I think he is telling them what things cost in the way of a renovation or an addition. And in Amy's case, I think there are many people who are not educated as to the cost of an interior design project. So I think all three of us are doing those things. I think we're educating, but we're hoping to align their budget you know, with their expectations. And I think that's important for all three of our disciplines. But I think it really depends. Your answer to the question is, I think it depends upon that particular person. I think this is where it, no amount of questions is too much. I think the more we ask, the more we know, the more we're able to lead them and guide them in the direction that we think they're telling us they want to go. So Bill, if you, ha if you had to pick three of the best spaces to invest in your home, um, whether you're selling it now or a year from now, um, not knowing where we're going, what, what would you, what are your three favorite spaces? I'd hearken back to the three I mentioned earlier, Sonny. I'd say that the kitchen family room, I think if you're thinking that you want to spend some more time in your home, I think that's a valuable upgrade or valuable improvement because that, as I said earlier, is the number one item on the list. I think secondarily, redoing, renovating your master bath. That always is something that buyers will look for. And thirdly, the spaces that I'm calling the extras, the optional spaces, the playroom, the lower level, the third floor, et cetera. I think all of those can not only pay you back as a current resident, but when you go to sell, you're gonna find those are the value spaces that buyers today are looking for. So then Amy, fun question. What are your three favorite spaces to design? I definitely love a dining room. I think when I start, I actually, think of the dining room as the core to a house. And, and I almost build off of that most of the time. I think it's one of the places where it can be the most whimsical. It can be, you know, it doesn't have as many requirements as some of the other spaces. So it can be moodier or it can have, you know, different textures. And, you know, like my backdrop here is actually at my home, which is this great DiGiorni wallpaper. So you can make different investments in there and it doesn't have to feel as committed to the other spaces, right? That you're in every single day. So I think that a dining room is fantastic. I always go back to the bar because we've been doing them. We've actually been doing them for quite a bit of time. And I think it allows it to take you to a completely different place. It can be much more theatrical and you, you can use different metals and materials and leathers. And, you know, it just doesn't have to feel like typical cabinetry, you know, it, in different woods and different species. So I think it's, it's areas where you can be a bit more bold and, and a little riskier and, and show a client's personality to that. So, uh, you know, the bar and, and if it's connected to a lounge, right? So anything that is got seating areas that are of, of comfort, we do fabulous sitting areas where it's even just really intimate, four chairs and an ottoman. It's one of the most successful things that we do for clients. So, and I think it's about texture and and layers and that brings out the client's personality, whether it's in color or no color or just um, the materials that you're using. So, you know, those are kind of the three spaces that we, we love to tackle, but. I have to say, I've seen a lot of your, the texture, I've seen you do a woven, I think it was a leather floor in a bar and it's, it really is stunning because you don't forget it. I mean, you know, people walk out and they remember that um as a statement so oh, it's really it's memorable i think that most you know you you want to enjoy them with your family and with friends right and in that situation that you saw you know that's a lot of convincing that has to happen i, I use this term you know you have to trust me it's the trust me moment because there are moments that you know clients don't realize that leather only gets better with age and it's okay to spill on it and it can take the beating of it so you know i i think that you just can't things can't be so pristine and they don't need to be and that you should be able to use them and, and, and appreciate them. And I also think it's a great teaching lesson for kids, right? Or clients say, oh, I don't know if I want my children to really interact with that. I think children only learn if they're gonna interact with that. And so all of our clients have so many children that it's really important, right? And then they get to appreciate it. They get to grow with it. So I'm always introducing that into our, our environments. 
And I think that goes to another reason why, you know, going back to using experts like all three of you become important because, you know, I, you know, general people, I would never know that leather is okay to spill on and that it wears, you know, that, and that's, that's really, you know, goes back to why experts are, are so important in this process. Chuck, how about you, three favorite spaces? Well, I'll, I'll add uh, some different things. I mean, I have the most fun with kind of maybe, maybe the worst investments, which are, you know, the, all, all those, the, the wine cellar or the, or the pool house, or, you know, some of those really, I mean, we just, just finished this pool house. It was so cool. And we, we had these carved columns and internally lit and the whole thing kind of floated, looked like it was floating on the pool. These kind of fun, whimsical spaces that, you know, are all about somebody's passion. Um, you know, the, the indoor pool, you, would, you know, we don't do a lot of them, but we've done, we've done some of them. Um, those kind of spaces that are, are kind of out of the ordinary and that I think really connect with that particular owner. You know, some people are sports uh, enthusiasts, some people are uh, a car and driving uh, enthusiasts. And so, you know, can you, you know, do a garage for a, a car full of Ferraris? I mean, that, how fun is that? So those are the, the really fun, interesting spaces and, and maybe not the best investments, but um, maybe the most appreciated by the clients, so. I was gonna say, I mean, I've seen a lot of your creative work too. That's kind of neat to be able to go back to someone and, and be, be able to be that specific. And, you know, I, you can only imagine the client's face when they get something that's so special. Right. But I think that's our job to push, right? And I think that, you know, I always say that you have to put it out there because the client doesn't know unless you're going to actually, you know, express that these are the options that are out there. So, you know, what what we all get to do is is be able to exemplify that this is a possibility and it's ultimately their discretion. But if you lead the way, normally it kind of, it does come true. It's just, you know, how do you do that within the realm of, of their bandwidth and their budget and and, and the environment around it, but you always have to try. And the skill, I think the skill and, and, and the experience is that, you know, you're playing to something they really want that's really so important or, or that they're so passionate about or that they've always dreamed about. And, and then, you know, they, they're willing to take that leap of faith with you and maybe make that extra investment for that really kind of special place. So, you know, I always try, I mean, a lot of what we do is very similar from client to client. And yet I'm always trying to find the thing that's really different or very special about them and make sure that the house that we design has a place or a space or, or plays to that thing that's most personal to them. That's great. And I'm as you said, I'm sure for all three of you, trust has got to play a pretty big role um, in trusting you and, and, you know, but all three of you seem to really know your clients um, so well um, that it really, Bill, I'm sure trust plays a lot for you as well. Oh, Sonny, definitely. Because in some cases we're with a client for a year or maybe in other cases a little bit longer. So we get to know their kids' names, their dogs' names. We get to know everything about them and trust is paramount. And I think it is a business of trust. And I think it's, as I said earlier, it's about listening skills and trying to discern what it is the person wants. I think a good point that Chuck made is we're trying all the time to find the passion. What is it that people are really passionate about that we can hopefully deliver to them in a home? I think it's also important, I think Chuck and Amy would agree that I'm one that will also let them know that while they may want something very personal in the way of an addition or a component in the house, they must be aware that it may not be something that's appealing to the market at large. And so when they go to sell, they may not get a dollar back for every dollar spent. And I think Chuck can weigh in on that as well. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it, it's been a difficult, uh, conversations a, a lot in recent years as home values have not gone up. And I think, you know, what I've heard a lot is I don't need to make money on this, but I don't want to lose money either. And for a long time, you know, house values were stagnant or going down. So there was a real reluctance to kind of take a risk with those things. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that, um, you know, now that things are recovering, that it might be a little more leeway for people to invest in things that are really important to them and not not worry about that quite as much as you know in the 80s and 90s it wasn't as 
prevalent, I think, the, the, the concern because the property values were escalating and, and if somebody overspent on, on some um, passional, uh, passionate item, you know, they kind of just lost it in the appreciation. Um, and that hasn't been the case, you know, in recent years, but uh, we'll see. But I do think that clients, they, and if, if they've been existing clients and they come back, you know, I just had it re happen recently, you know, they went, they did the gusto, right? They, they, they did the best finishes. They did the finest selections. You know, this is what they wanted. But, you know, now looking to the next phase of their life, they realize that maybe they don't need to put certain expenses in, into certain places. So they're wiser to knowing where to spend, right? You know, maybe that door handle that was custom and it was integrated into you know, the cabinetry, maybe it shifts to a different place, right? So they're, they're wise and they're smart in how to spend that now. And also I think, I mean, some of these things are just an investment in your, your comfort and your happiness and in your family. And, you know, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, well, is the pool worth it and the outdoor entertainment space and the grill, well, if you're going to be there for 10 years and that's where you're going to do, you know, entertaining five or six months a year and you're, children and their friends are all going to come and hang at your house. And I mean, I, I've seen houses just transform family life, you know, in mo the most wonderful way. And so, I mean, you don't want to get ridiculous about investments, but um, it, it, I mean, there is just a, an element of an investment in the quality of the life that you want to live and, you know, what, what's it worth to you, you know? And Chuck, hey, to oh, go ahead, Bill. Sonny, I think Chuck's point is excellent because I, as a realtor, really th have thought for 30 years that what I'm selling is a quality of life. I'm selling a lifestyle and a quality of life here. And uh, we have some fantastic homes, but I think that as a group of realtors, we are promoting a town that is, to me, the preeminent community in the Northeast. And so I think that all goes hand in hand with what Chuck just said. Agreed. Agreed. Amy, I, you know, do you see one of the, just changing a little bit, technology? Um, are you seeing technology as an investment or clients coming to you about technology? I think that they want to just simplify their lives and how do they better that, right? So if that is technology that's based within, you know, their lighting system and their TVs and their servants, but I also think that the new technology it also lies in the ease of living, right? So their kitchens now are not of statuary marble, which <laughs> my husband kind of wants to shoot me for having, but you know, they want an engineered product that they don't have to think about, right? So it's not as pure, but it's something where it has the durability and it has the longevity. So, you know, that's what we're seeing a lot more. We don't want the maintenance. We don't want to have to think about these products. So what is out there? And it goes back to all three of us just educating ourselves constantly with what's out there in the market. So, you know, you're constantly going to new showrooms, you're, you're seeing what the vendors have. And that seems to be the top request that we get. Just very, very little maintenance. Chuck, are you, well, how about you? Are you seeing a lot of new technology or playing a big role? Houses have so much more uh, built-in technology than they ever did, you know, a, a when I started in my career and it just, the houses are so packed. I mean, the, you know, what's LED lighting, spray foam, you know, high performance glazing. I mean, all that stuff is ubiquitous and, and, and really kind of standard offering it now. Um, but, you know, things that save energy. I mean, our clients, you know, they, if, if there's a reasonable payback, they're generally on board for, for things like geothermal or heat pumps or, um, you know, in some places, solar, uh, the battery backup systems, uh, certainly generators and stuff. Uh, and we've done these cogeneration units where you're making your own electricity on site and then recapturing all the waste heat and it saves money and it's also more environmentally friendly. So I think the, the, the energy saving technologies are, are kind of a big thing. The conductivity that Amy mentioned, you know, everything related to smart house and and they can be quickly become overwhelming and, and too complicated. But there's a lot of features. People are more and more comfortable. And most of the things are run by your iPhone now. And everybody's kind of used with those interfaces. 
And then there's these whole, this is a whole other area that you don't really maybe think of as technology, but it's really the material sciences. And so Amy was talking about, you know, there's, there's synthetic stones and synthetic tiles and things that look and perform really well, but that are, are man-made, the cellular PVC trim we're using pretty much all the time on the projects and it needs a lot less painting. And when the house is torn down, it can be recycled as opposed to, you know, building with mahogany and tearing down the, uh, the, the, the rainforest. And one of the, the newest things what we haven't done yet, but is really intriguing to me is the idea of uh, lighting systems that change color th to mimic uh, the sun during the day. So th your house is programmed and the, the system knows in the morning when you wake up in the evening, you get this like low uh, orange, you know, amber light and during wow. the day it's daylight. And, you know, we're so um, affected by all the blue lights and all the screens in our lives. And, you know, it, it's a very interesting technology to me to, that, that, that the day that the artificial lighting and the LEDs are now being able to be programmed and really, uh, you know, back to the theme of kind of healthy homes. To, to mimic the the daylight that's outside and, and mimic the season. So I think that's one of the, the most interesting new things uh, the last year or so. That, I, I mean, I very cool. I want that. <laughs> yeah, I know. We'd yeah. all look really good right now. No. <laughs> no, I think that's great. All right, before, before we turn it back over, I just want to ask if each of you guys would share an unforgettable maybe request um, um, from clients you've gotten this past year and you don't have to name names <laughs> bill <laughs> gee sunny let me think about that one um that is a tough one if it's that unusual um well i had a person that has said and this is the first for me in 30 years that they were thinking of putting in a grass tennis court on the property mm -hmm. And uh, when I think of grass, I think of Wimbledon, of course. But uh, there are a number of tennis courts, as all of us know, throughout Greenwich. Many of them hard courts, some of them clay. But I don't think there are too many grass courts. So that was an unusual one. That is. That's a good one. I, I, I'm looking at Amy. Look around, Chuck. Do you? Oh, I, don't, I don't know what our on uh, what our. I don't know if we really had a bizarre request. I mean, I think, you know, it, it doesn't. You know, we get asked a lot of different things to produce, but it's not any, anything that's, you know, shocking or yeah unusual. I don't know, Chuck, have you? I, nothing crazy. Like I said earlier, I think, I think, you know, a lot of what we've gotten is maybe an amplification of trends that have been going. I, I mean, one that um, I was discussing recently with a client and we haven't started yet, but they were working on one project for them and they want us to work on another property uh, upstate and they want to do kind of a rec uh, barn with a whole bunch of a squash court and you know um, all these kind of recreation spaces and um, I, it sounds really fun you know inside a big old barn and uh, I'm interested to see the space and kind of explore the program with them so I think that you know goes to that entertainment at home and indoor outdoor entertaining idea uh, so that maybe that's uh, maybe the most fun or interesting thing. That's pretty cool. I've, I've stumped Amy. Amy's like, no, you know, I, I think that it's, you know, it's nothing so unusual. I just think that everybody wants something that's really uniquely them. Right. And, and what, how do you incorporate them? And it goes back to what Bill said. I think the best tool that we can have is to listen. I could be the most creative and I could be, you know, and, and you could be the best architect, but if you're not listening and you're not paying attention, then you have like the most unsuccessful projects. So I think that the listening and then giving them, you know, their little wish list along the way is the most important part and incorporating them and their children and their friends and their, you know, that that's a big component of what we do. So, you know, listen, we've put swings in, we've put, you know, un, I don't know, we've, we've, put in, you know, large scale fireplaces that are kind of mass, mass sizes and they, they travel and they're just not your typical, you know, size. I, you know, I yeah. think it's maybe bigger sometimes, I, but nothing so crazy. I love it. I love it. Well, it's before we again, turn it back to questions. Um, Chuck, you just, oh yeah. 
the limo. Actually, the limo is. Oh. The, okay, wait. That's it. <laughs> so I do. We're doing our first commercial property, and it's really, it's been, it's really energizing, and it, it kind of is bringing a whole community together. And um, my client is extremely ingenious and artistic in his own way, and you know he has actually requested a train to have a full train. Unfortunately, that is you know, waste tons and the building can't support it. And the other was actually creating kind of a limo within a space that's kind of hidden. So it's, it's it, it, unusual. That one's actually a bit unusual. That's a good one. That was, that was good. All right, so right before we turn over, um, Chuck, your new book. It's awesome. It's doing so well. We have a copy. I know our editors at Serendipity were super excited. Um, can you give us uh, just a little, tell everyone just a little bit about it? Sure. Um, so, you know, it, it uh, features some projects, some properties in Greenwich that we've worked on for a number of years where there's a number of projects and uh, buildings over time and some of our latest and greatest work, uh, nine properties altogether and probably like 20 different buildings um, it, within, the, uh, within the book. Um, it's uh, called uh, Classic Greenwich Houses, and it's there's one one project that's in Westchester, but it's really kind of taking a look at uh, you know what what's special about homes in Greenwich, and uh, you know what they have in common and what they have that's unique. And uh, we're really excited to have the book out there. Have Diane's as a partner, and Hoagland's has uh, books as well. Um, and uh, so the holidays are coming up, and uh, if we think it, we think it makes a wonderful gift. And I, I brought a wrap one. Diane's is going to have beautiful wrapped signed copies, and um, you can contact them between now and Christmas and pick pick one up. So if you uh, if you're uh, short of a, a Christmas gift, we think it would make a, a great uh, stocking stuffer or a client gift, or or so. Um, but thank you very much, and we're. We're excited that it's out and about. Well, congratulations. Well, now, now we all just need a signed copy. So we'll, yeah, I'll we'll just knock jump, at the door. I'll get a plug for Chuck, if I may. I have the copy right here. Ah. It's actually a fantastic book. It's a wonderful read, beautiful photographs. And I think it's a must have for anybody who likes houses. And it just shows Chuck's wonderful ingenuity and creativity. So I would second that. Go out and get it for someone on your Christmas list. Thanks, Bob. Wow, and thank you, everybody. This is Rick here, the local history librarian in the background. And what a great discussion from everybody. I want to follow up with some of the Q&A that came in from our audience. And the first question, uh, the first two of them sort of speak to um, what clients are requesting. And some of this you spoke to a little bit, but I want to bring it up together to see if there's a little more to elaborate on. They're asking, uh, first of all, Amy and Charles, in your designs, are your clients requesting multiple office spaces in student learning rooms? Now that's connected to the next question. So let me just read this. The New York Times just had an article on how working from home has shown the downside of open plan homes. And this person loves open plan homes, but they understand with five people in their home, working, schooling, uh, all the extra bodies in the space uh, that can be challenging. Um, have you seen anything related to this new need? Um, and this is a commercial designer asking the question. So just posing those two to the group. I think of course it's, you know, it's been a bit of a challenge of in some of our smaller homes of where, where do people study? Where does everybody work? So, you know, it's, it's carving out certain spaces for our clients and, and finding a home for them. You know, I do find though that, you know, children are doing homework in their kitchen, right? In breakfast nooks. So I think that people should utilize those spaces if they can and, and have the quiet time. I mean, even my children do it. One will use her bedroom and one will actually use the kitchen. So I think any space, you know, can be adapted to kind of the new norm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for uh, husband and wife both working at home, having separate spaces when people are on Zoom calls and you know important things are going on seems to be a, a requirement. Um, we're definitely getting people asking for two dedicated home offices. You know, sometimes they're next to each other. Sometimes one's off the bedroom and one's downstairs. Um, 
for the children, you know, sometimes people prefer their children to study in their room. Sometimes there's like a homework area or a study room. Sometimes it's a kitchen. I think the thing is that the spaces need to be flexible and going all the way back to what Amy said at the beginning. I mean, you know, being able to have rooms that you, where you can close doors off and have quiet space, uh, you know, a lot of rooms can function as those kind of overflow rooms. So um, the ability just to close rooms off instead of completely open floor plans, you could still have very wide openings and still have big pocket doors or things to, to kind of close things off. So Great, thank you. And this other question uh, seems to be related. Uh, they're asking if each of you could please tell us your favorite home style. Now, to piggyback on that just a little bit, someone else wants to ask Charles specifically about traditional wood construction versus steel versus concrete for a residential house and the latest trends in that direction. So I wonder if you could, um, if all of you could speak about your favorite style home and then if Charles could talk about the construction. Um, I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, well, you know, we've done a lot of, of uh, Georgian homes. It's it's a style that I really enjoy doing. Um, and some are brick, some are stone. Um, I, I kind of like the organization and the symmetry um, and kind of the stateliness of it. But, you know, the shingle style homes are really a lot of fun to work on. They're a lot more casual and kind of really uh, have opportunity to interact with the outside. I love doing waterfront and they fit very well on the waterfront. So I think those are, are two different ones. Um, almost everything we do is wood frame construction. Um, uh, we can do some steel. We, we haven't done any really concrete and concrete and block. Uh, it's very common overseas and in a lot of other places in the world. We've kind of mastered wood frame and, and with all the utilities and things that we have to put into the wall systems, it works very well for us. and the cost, it, it, it is significant to step up to all steel frame or steel and concrete frame. So we just don't end up doing it uh, rarely. Rick, I'll jump in for a minute and say that I think one of the things, and Amy and Chuck certainly know this, one of the things that makes Greenwich such an appealing place to be a realtor is the fact that we have such an eclectic inventory. We have Georgians, we have Normandies, we have postmodern homes, we have Beaux Arts, we have so many different ones that I think that's what lends a real interest element to our looking when the buyers come out with us for the first time and see the vast array of architecture that's here. We virtually don't have anything that would be like a cookie cutter subdivision. And that's very, very appealing to many people. And I think that we're so fortunate in what we do that we get to explore so many different projects for all of our clients. So, you know, we, we too, we get to do the shingle style house, the farmhouse, um, the ski house, which is actually one of my favorites, um, just because it's not your everyday house. So those projects tend to be a little bit different. And so we, we do love having a client who sometimes has multiple homes because they have one personality one personality, which is in their main home, and it may feel a bit differently than something, you know, that they are traveling to and that they're entertaining in and the needs and the requirements are quite different. So you, you, it gets to be a little bit more playful or whimsical in the secondary homes. So, you know, again, we're, we're really fortunate to be able to, to kind of play in all these different spaces. I agree. Thanks, everyone. And Sunny, I wonder if even you have a favorite style home style you could share? Um, you know, that's a great question. I, you know, I lean towards, towards modern. I mean, I spent, it's funny, I've lived all over the countries, but I spent a lot of time out in California and I very much like to incorporate just, you know, pieces of water and, you know, blues and soothing and modern and, and natural. Um, but great, um, I think. yeah. That's great. And everybody's right. And we at Greenwich has just about all of that. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. And I think what everybody got most excited about, it seemed, when you were all talking was the energy efficiency that seemed to get a great rise out of everyone. So as an extension to energy efficiency, do you see your clients being interested in environmentally friendly and even responsibly made products and practices? Oh, I think Rick Chuck answered that very well earlier, a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I think that 
everybody, if you, if you look at something just as basic as the mechanical room today or the furnace room, you see these high efficiency furnaces that are the size of a small suitcase. And, you know, they can run an entire home. Uh, I think the things that Chuck mentioned regarding lighting and technology and being able to run your home from your phone. You can be in New York City on your way out and turn on the heat and turn on the lights and all of those things. I think that people love that sort of gadgetry, if you will. Yeah, I mean, uh, people, I think most people plan on spending a significant number of years in their home um, when they're hiring us. So um, they seem, you know, they, I, I, not many of them come in saying, I want to be the greenest, most environmentally sensitive, most energy efficient. But when we present the options to them and they see what the payback is and they understand the impact for the environment, I would say the majority of them trade up you know, to a pretty high level without getting too carried away. So there's just a lot of, a uh, lot of great technologies and they're changing so fast. And, um, you know, compared to, you know, older homes that people might be living in and moving out of or, or renovating, um, there's just so much that can be done with uh, most houses. So a lot of opportunity. And the main Amy, has it? Yeah, go ahead, Amy. I was wondering if it has influenced some of the products that, uh, and materials you're using. I just think that people in general, I think, you know, we built our own house three years ago. And, you know, as we, as we get older, we also just don't want to have to constantly maintain it, right? So having a roof that has a lifetime of a span of, you know, 60 years and, and having, you know, aluminum windows that, you know, not the maintenance to paint. So I think that people are really savvy to, to introducing product within their home that they, you know, they just don't have to think about all the time, right? Yes, you have to paint your house, but you may not, if you use a certain product underneath, it may get you further. You know, New England takes a, a beating in, in our environment, but, you know, there's just so much out there. And I think, again, it goes back to just living simply and how can you do that? Yeah, low maintenance is a huge Ooh. concern and request. Well, thank you so much, everybody. What a great treat for our Greenwich audience. And thank you to our, our panelists, our moderator. And again, thank you to our audience. I want to remind everybody that holiday copies of the classic Greenwich Houses book, uh, including some signed copies available at Diane's Books. Uh, so thank you again to a great audience for joining us, our moderator, our panelists. We really appreciate your insightful and timely thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.